It's good to be here. Look at all of you. I hope you've had a good week. I've heard you've had some good keynotes. I hate to break that string, but... <laughs> Today's sermon is on teaching reading with complex text. You know, I don't do handouts, but I do post my slides on my, on my website, and these will be posted. So, you know, slides are better than handouts. You can sell the slides. Um, so it, if you go to Shanahan on Literacy, and, uh, you know, that's, as, he, as Brandon mentioned, that's my, uh, that's my website. There's no advertising there. There's no sales there. There's nothing like that. And so, you know, I hope you go and use those resources, and, and some of you might even want to uh, subscribe to, to the newsletter, and, and you can find out about some of those fights that, that Brandon mentioned. But uh, this slide isn't mine. This is one that I have, have uh, taken. Uh, yeah, in fact, I assume you've already seen this slide sometime this week. It's, it's from this group. Um, and if we go down to the, I mean, each of these is important, but some of these are more relevant to what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, you know, if we drop down to the, the, that fourth graph on, on that slide, educational equity ensures that all children, regardless of circumstances, are receiving high-quality grade-level standards-aligned instruction with access to high-quality materials and resources. You know, we have had a a tendency in the United States, and not just recently, this is something that is, is long-standing and it, it uh, uh, cuts across all kinds of lines of diversity, but essentially, uh, I can remember when I first came into teaching back in the, the 1960s, this for a little while, the, uh, one of the things that reading educators would talk about scoffingly uh, was how in the, in the old days, uh, teachers would have three reading groups, right? There'd be, what we were told, there were the, the bluebirds and, and, and the robins and the crows. <laughs> and while well, no one was talking about it at the time, the fact is the crows tended to be the kids with learning problems the kids from households without a lot of education and educational resources, uh, probably a lot of minority kids, and so on. But we, we learned that that isn't a good way to work. And so these days, we avoid all that by having three reading groups, one an L, one an H, and one a G. It's the same game. It's the same game, but we've, we've claimed that there's science to it. What we do when we do that kind of instruction where, uh, you know, those, those uh, uh, bluebirds and robins and, and crows get different instruction and, and different reading materials and so on, the claim has been that we're facilitating their education, that we're teaching those kids where they're at, and we're, which sounds terrific. But the reality of it, it means that we're not ensuring that those kids receive the same high quality grade level standards aligned instruction that the other kids are. In education, it should mean that uh, <laughs> everyone has the best or most likely chance of learning. I can remember a study done a while ago uh, by sociologists Sorensen and, and Hallen, and done right in this state where we're, we're having this meeting. And they looked at a large number of schools, and they went in and they looked at those, especially in those primary grades, those young children who were in those multiple groups being taught with different materials and so on. And what they found was that there was no educational benefit to it. The, the kids in those groupings weren't doing any better than the kids who weren't in such groupings. But the, the deck was actually being shuffled a bit. You know, the, the average achievement was the same as it had been. So the, you know, the overall group wasn't doing any better. But what they found at the end of the day is, is to, to uh, you know, maintain that, uh, that level of performance, essentially what was happening is the, the lowest kids were actually slipping down the ladder a bit. They weren't doing so well. And the top kids were coming up a little bit. And what was happening is the African-American kids were actually doing less well. 
the low SES kids were actually doing less well. And so this notion of, of we've got to make sure that everybody gets the best or most likely chance of learning, I'd have to say that's our responsibility and it's one that we're not meeting very well. My topics are always on how can we help kids to read better. The particular topic that I talk, I'm, I'm going to talk about today is really for everybody. It's, it's not just, you know, how do we... How do we help the lowest kids? It's really how do we you know, help everybody? But the message that I hope it carries, the, 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 the insight that I hope it, it, it provides you is that in the past we have tried to protect kids from being, being asked to learn those grade level things, to being asked to learn the same things that their other classmates are learning. And I think that we need to look at what the research has to say on that topic, and I think we need to look at what good practice would suggest on that topic. And I think what you're going to see is a lot of the things we've been doing that we've claimed had science behind it, or that we've claimed is the only way you can do it pedagogically, those things just aren't true. And so we need to be willing and open to, to changing our, our practices. Now, if you... If you look at um, the standards that many of your states have adopted, and, and I know not everybody uh, in the country is a common core state, but you know, it, that actually doesn't matter. First of all, there, there are like more than 40 states that are part of common core, so that's, that's the base. But even states that aren't part of common core, uh, I'm, I live in Illinois, I, the state next door to us, Indiana, they're, they're not part of common core. But the standards I'm going to talk about today, even those states have adopted. And so this is it's almost universal. It's almost the entire country. And these standards have asked us to do something very, very different than what we've done in the past. Um, if you think about it, our standards in the past have tended to emphasize two things. They've tended to, when it comes to reading and education, they've tended to emphasize decoding. Right? We want to make sure our boys and girls can, can make sense uh, of the, the print on the page. They can somehow translate it, that into language. And then those cognitive skills, those comprehension strategies and, and such, those, those uh, uh, things that uh, you know, come down to making sense of or interpreting the content of, of what we're reading. The so-called simple view, right? The simple view holds that kids have to be able to decode and if they can decode, if they can essentially turn the text into language, you know, then they just have to do normal listening comprehension and everything's going to be terrific. And it, it's, it's, it's a very simple theory, but it actually holds a lot of weight. The thing is, in my 50 years at this, we have been through a lot of reforms, a lot of reforms, lots of changing, lots of updating, uh, and, and what we have tended to do in each of those reforms when we've changed standards is to put greater emphasis on decoding skills and greater emphasis on those cognitive skills. Have you looked at our reading achievement results lately? Do you see how they're just zooming forward? I mean, there have been over the, since 1970 when they started collecting these kinds of data, there have certainly been ups and downs, times where we backed away from these skills that I'm talking about and achievement has dropped a little bit, and times when we've really doubled down and made sure more people were doing these things and, and achievement has come up a little bit. Is there anyone in the room who actually believes if we improved our job in these areas, you know, did a little bit better job in teaching decoding skills or a little bit better job of teaching kids, you know, how to, how to think about text, that we would see much higher reading achievement? Would we really move kids a year or two years? And I'd say no. I'm a big supporter and proponent of all these skills that I'm talking about. But the fact of the matter is, for the most part, what, what the economists talk about, these are kind of baked in the cake already. We're pretty much doing these. I, I'm not saying everybody's doing them as well as we could, but the fact is, if we all did a little bit better job at it, it's probably not going to move things very far because it's never moved it very far in the past. 
if you really want to raise achievement markedly, as much as we need to, we really need to pull kids up a year, two years high, on average. I mean, we should think about what that means across the whole nation, across your states or your districts. We're going to have to figure out what we're not teaching, what's missing from the formula. We need the decoding skills. There's no question kids have to translate print into language. That has to happen. And if we're not doing a good job of that, we ought to try to improve on that. And certainly once kids get that information, they should be able to think about it effectively. And we can teach kids to do that. And if we're not doing that well enough in, in you know, your local situation, we ought to be doing a better job of that. But if we're really going to make things better, we've got to figure out what we're not doing. And I've got a candidate. I've got something that I would suggest goes in that, that box in the middle. And I would say it's language. Now think about it. Uh, your districts, I'm sure, are different than what we have in Chicago, so I know that you, you couldn't possibly know what I'm talking about. But if you think about it, in, in your districts, you don't need to pay attention to language because the notion has been, you know, if the kids can just translate the text into language, then they can do things like summarize the text, ask questions about it, uh, visualize it. The assumption has been that the language interpretation happens automatically and just happens for everybody. But that's because you guys don't have any second language kids in your districts. Except, you know, I bet some of you do. The standards that your states have adopted most likely are different than any standards that they had put in place before in one particular way. Because if you look at your standards, for the most part, those, those standards are still long lists of skills, and they tend to largely be skills that are decoding skills or those text interpretation skills that I'm talking about. But there's one standard in the whole list that's very different than the others. And in fact, in, in most of the states, they've got 10 reading standards. And those 10 reading standards, the first nine are almost identical to what you used to have. But that number 10 is the one that's so interesting. Because that number 10, I'm going to paraphrase, I don't have the standard in front of me. But the standard says something along the lines of those first nine things that these boys and girls are supposed to be able to do, they have to be able to do it with text of a particular level of difficulty. And that, folks, changes everything. Let's imagine, let's go back and do a little thought experiment. Let's go back to the 1980s, late 1980s, when states first started putting in educational standards. And let's imagine for a moment, we're in California, so this is going to be easy to imagine. Let's imagine that the political uh, leaders of the time decided that we didn't need reading standards, we needed weightlifting standards. Um, and that let's imagine that we wrote those standards very similarly to the standards that we've had in reading for all these years. Those standards would probably say something along the lines of, uh, kindergartners need to be able to do arm curls. At this point, I'd imagine it's dawning on a few of you that I've been doing an amazing number of arm curls for a man my age. <laughs> I get the disrespect. I, I feel it. Uh, <laughs> what's wrong with my arm curls? They're pretty terrific, I thought. Is there anything wrong with them? No weight? Well, if I had weight on here, I couldn't do this many. <laughs> yeah, there's no weight. We are specifying skills. You have to be able to do arm curls, but we're not saying how many or how heavy the weight has to be. It's just kindergartners have to do arm curls, first graders have to do arm curls, the third graders, fifth graders. 
The same way that, frankly, our standards always said, you know, kids have to be able to find a main idea, or kids have to be able to compare characters. And I would have to ask you the same question. And how much weight is supposed to be on the bar? Because that's those standards that I just mentioned were identical for kindergartners and third graders and seventh graders and ninth graders. And teachers could easily say, well, you know, well, in fact, it used to happen to me with some regularity. You'd go into, say, a fourth grade classroom and a teacher would be working with a group of kids and, and you, you'd, you'd talk to the teacher about it and she'd say, those are my low kids. So that'd be the crows group, I guess. Those are my low kids. And, and you'd say, well, what does that mean? And she'd say, what it means is they're working in a second grade book, but I'm teaching them the fourth grade standards. And what these new standards are saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, is if you are teaching the fourth grade skill or exercise or action with the second grade weights, those aren't the fourth grade standards, those are the second grade standards. Text matters the same way weight matters. Now, I know you guys were very disrespectful about my arm curls. <laughs> We unfortunately don't have time. Under this coat, I am cut, but... <laughs> okay, you're not buying that either. Um, my wife said you wouldn't. Um, why did the folks who wrote these standards, and I was one of those folks, why did the folks who wrote these standards do that? Why did they put in the weight? Why did they put in that there were levels of text difficulty that kids had to learn the same way they had to learn those various skills? And I will point out one study, a study that's been replicated a number of times with various tests. The, the example I'm going to give focuses on the ACT test, the one that our high school kids take, you know, to, you know, see if they're ready for college. Um, it's just an example. If I were to show you a similar study with any other test, including any of your state tests, any of the common core, so-called common core tests, any of the commercial standardized reading comprehension, you would find exactly what ACT found with their test um, and that people have been finding with any of these tests since, actually since the mid-1940s. Um, so it's not like a new finding. I just like the way ACT put it out. Now, this is a lousy looking slide. I think you'd agree. That's intentional. Um, I, you can see I, all I've done is photocopied this, and I wanted to make sure that you recognize that that was just a, a cheap photocopy that I just took from ACT. This is their own report. This isn't something that I did or something that, oh boy, is ACT going to be mad about this? These are their own data. They published these. I had somebody send me some beautiful slides of this, but it makes it look like it's mine. And I don't want anyone to make that mistake. If you look at this chart, the, the, the bottom row across the, the, the so-called x-axis, that 11, 12, 13, up to 36, that, those are the kids' ACT scores. So if a youngster were to get, say, 23 on the ACT, uh, their data would be summarized someplace up above that that. Uh, number 23 there, and obviously the lowest readers are on the left and the highest readers on, are on the right. The y-axis, the column, goes 0 to 100. That uh, is the percent correct that the kids get on the, on the reading comprehension test, and not surprisingly, the kids with the lowest ACT scores get the lowest reading comprehension and so on, that, which is the reason why the, that, those lines go angling across. Can you see that there are two lines being summarized there, the, that diagonal line that's running across there? One of those shows how the boys and girls do uh, on the uh, literal recall items. These are the items where all, the author states something explicitly, and all you have to do is either remember what he said or, or go back and find what it said, and the, the answer's right there. 
Um, so, you know, if it says it was snowing and, and the question is, what was the weather like? You know, was it sunny? Was it snowing? Was it raining? Hmm. You know, I wonder which one it is. You, you know, fairly easy to p figure out. The other line summarizes the performance of the boys and girls on inferential and interpretive questions, on those higher order thinking or higher order reasoning questions. The ones where the information isn't right in the text, but you have to somehow you know, put stuff together or you know, bring in some kind of prior knowledge or draw inferences to fill gaps or whatever. What do you notice about the two lines? Really close, aren't they? The thing is that that space you see in between the two lines, it's just statistical noise. In fact, the two lines are absolutely identical. What I'm saying is the kids perform exactly the same whether the questions are just those lowest, most straightforward skills of just being able to get what the author says explicitly and those supposedly higher order skills that are asking the kids to do so much more. There is absolutely no difference in performance. And, I'm, and when I say there's no difference, there's no difference if you are a, a really low reader, if you're the kids getting 11s and 12s and 13s on the test, it's not, there's no difference if you're an average reader, you're you know, at that college ready line. There's no difference if you're a superstar. It comes out exactly the same all the way across. That should surprise some of you. That should surprise you that the, those skills are performed exactly the same way at all levels of performance. It shouldn't have surprised ACT because, as I say, there are studies on this going back to 1944. ACT decided maybe they weren't doing a close enough analysis. So they broke, broke out performance based on the main idea questions, the support in details questions, the relationships among characters and relationships among ideas questions, the vocabulary questions, the drawing conclusions questions, one line. There's absolutely no difference in performance. How many of you have been told over the years that what we're supposed to do, if you want to raise achievement, use your data? Go in and look at those test scores and see, not, don't just look at the score, look at how the kids do on specific items because those items match up with the standards and then teach the hell out of whichever items the kids are doing poorly on. <laughs> so if in your third grade, the kids, the main idea part of their brain isn't working, if we give them enough main idea questions, they're going to do better on the test. And what this data is saying is that's a fool's errand. The fact is you cannot teach any of those skills in any meaningful way that will raise achievement, that they're all just part of something bigger because they're all just clumped together like that. You don't perform differently on, on one of these or another. People have never been able to find that. If you go and look at what the test makers write, they're very, they're honest, but I always worry that they're not as clear as they could be because they make it very clear that they ask questions based on your standards, but then they kind of elide over the fact that, and, but we're not going to give you any scores on those skills, we'll give you an overall score. And they do that for a reason, because those skill, scores would all be the same. Now... ACT, up to this point, has only done what everybody else has, has done. What they wanted to see, by the way, is they want to see those lines jump apart someplace. They want to find something diagnostic that you can do with the test. They want to be able to say, wow, she's low in main idea, and this one needs help with relationships, and this one, so that you could actually do something instructionally. They figured it out. They figured it out. They get the, the lines to jump apart. They did it. They did it by ignoring the skills and focusing on the texts. It's not the question types, it's the text. What makes a difference in reading comprehension? How well you can read the text. Yeah, but we have these different kinds of questions. Uh-huh. But what makes a difference is how well the kids could read the story or article or articles in, in these days. See, what happens... ACT does not test kids with a full range of passages. They don't go in with kindergarten or first grade passages and see if the kids are ready for college. You know, they have easier and harder passages, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a range. It just isn't the whole range. 
But what you see from these uh, uh, tables that are up here, these charts that are up here, at the low end, the lowest readers, it didn't seem to matter how easy or how hard any of the texts were within the range that ACT looked at. Those kids had trouble answering everything. They were low on everything. And those superstars up at the right-hand corner, those kids, uh, it didn't seem to matter how hard any of the passages were that ACT hit them with. They could read any of them. But for the rest of us, the 90 to 95% of us in between those extremes, what makes a difference in your reading is how well you can read. Kind of an interesting problem, isn't it? And so... Focusing on the question types instead of on the text is problematic. And so the, the, the standards were written to start paying attention. Now, in doing that, uh, I think we end up the same place that ACT ended up. Their, their summary of this was what they said is, no matter how easy no matter how straightforward a question was, if the text it was being asked about was hard, the kids couldn't answer it. And no matter how complex a question was, or how hard or demanding the thinking and reasoning that was supposedly underlying it, if the text was easy enough, the kids could answer it. It wasn't the, these questions that were making the difference. Reading is not the ability to answer certain kinds of questions. Reading is the ability to make sense of ideas expressed in text, the ability to negotiate the linguistic and conceptual barriers or affordances of a text. Every text is going to pose some kind of barriers for somebody. Um, I love William Faulkner. I don't know if there are any other William Faulkner fans in the room, but I love William Faulkner. I really enjoy reading Faulkner. Why do I enjoy reading Faulkner? Because his syntax, his, the way he constructs a sentence is so complicated. You've really got to be on your toes and you know, trying to work out the language and what he's saying because he has sentences that can go on for pages. More embedding and phrases and clauses than you've ever seen. Uh, I know people who love John Updike, and they love John Updike because his, his choice of words, his diction, is just perfect. He always knows exactly the word to use. But in both of those examples, in both of those affordances that those authors are giving, and whether it's that, that exquisite selection of vocabulary or that in, a brilliant construction of sentences, for us, it's affordances, and for somebody who's having difficulty with those features, they're barriers. Updike uses just the right word. You don't know what it means. That's a barrier. Man, he writes this incredible serpentine sentence that, that does more than just communicate ideas. It almost uh, uh, illustrates, uh, summarizes, uh, you know, maybe a particular relationship of, of people in, in the uh, story. And you get tripped up on it because the syntax is just, it, it, it's, it's obtuse to you. So for one person, it might be an affordance. One, it might be a barrier. Learning to read is learning to get over those barriers. And those barriers might be about language. Those barriers might be about the content. But they're not about what kind of question are we going to ask about that and how do you answer that kind of a question. I don't want to say anything about this particular slide. I mean, I'll, I'm, I'm going to make it enough to say, listen, folks, there are ways of measuring how difficult or challenging a text is. They're not perfect, but they do a pretty good job of predicting who's likely to have trouble reading a text, and they can give you a pretty good idea. They can place text on a continuum that, of, from easy to difficult. And your standards are using those, those schemes to... Uh, to essentially aim, you know, aim your efforts. So if gee, I teach fifth grade, you know, what level of text should the kids be able to read? You know, they've, they've got a way to, 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 to cast that. And I, I don't want to go beyond that. Um, 
And I don't need to say any of that. I said it. Uh, I want to point out one thing in the, this, these schemes where they've, they've you know, set these levels. S- many states have set levels f- for reading you know, how hard the text needs to be from grades 2 through 12. Nobody, nobody, not one state, nobody in this room, no one promoting the standards, no one who wrote on the standards, none of the states... Uh, is asking anyone to teach kindergartners or first graders with harder texts than in the past. That's really important that you know that. Uh, But from grades two and up, there's good reason to believe that we can not only do that safely, but we can do that in ways that will have a substantial impact on kids' reading abilities. So I just want to get that little clarification out there. Now... It's really terrific. You know, we've solved this problem. We've set standards. We've got standards now that say, well, they say teach fourth grade. Kids have to learn. They're not telling you how to teach it, but they're saying kids have to learn to read texts of specified levels of difficulty. And those specified levels of difficulty are, well, it depends on the grade level, but I think at fourth grade, they're about a half a year higher than what the typical textbooks have been in the past for those grade levels. And of course, if you follow it up, by the time kids are leaving high school, the levels that they're setting are about almost two full grade levels above where they are now. If we're successful with it, what it would mean is kids would be leaving school at whatever level they are about a year and a half to two years higher than they've been. So see, we solved the problem. We've got standards that say... Teach kids with harder text. It's all taken care of, right? I know there are, I was told there are a number of chief executive officers from many of the school districts represented here. Just go tell them to buy some of these new programs that have harder text. It's taken care of. I I can stop the talk right now. Except there's a problem with that. And the problem is I've been in classrooms. I've been in many, many classrooms. And I can tell you that when kids have trouble reading a text, teachers do things about it. And the things that they do make darn sure we're not going to teach those boys and girls to read those texts. So we have to figure out how are we ever going to do what I'm suggesting we need to, which is teach kids with harder books, grades 2 through 12, um, what do teachers do? Well, one of the, the, the most common ones I've already mentioned, and I want to, I'm just going to mention it again now because I want to talk about it at some length in a couple of minutes. But the most common thing that we see is that, that kind of grouping scheme I talked about. You know, you might be in my fourth grade classroom, but you know, you read like a second grader, so I'm going to put you in a second grade book. <laughs> we have a fourth grade book, and the fourth grade book's harder than the old fourth grade books, but it doesn't matter because I'm not going to let you read it anyway. Solve that problem. And so now we've got harder books, and teachers are still just teaching with easier texts because they're not required necessarily to, to try to teach the kids to read those books. We'll come back to that one. What else do teachers do? A real common one, especially in the, the primary grades, but not only in the primary grades, is if a text is hard for boys and girls, teachers read it to them. You know, I, my kids have trouble with the social studies book. That's not going to be a problem. I'll, I'll stand before the class and read it to them and tell them what it means. I'll get that information to them anyway. And so now they don't have to read that and it, my, our problem solved. What teachers are really doing is going around the problem. Gee, the kids are going to have trouble reading this text. How can I make sure that they get the information without having to read it? You know, I said that that was done more in primary grades than upper grades. I I was visiting a middle school, and the teacher said, well, you know, I would never do that. Uh, You know, I don't just read to the kids. You know, this is middle school. And I went and watched, and and she was kind of telling the truth. She wasn't reading the text of the kids, but she knew who the good readers were, and she'd call on them, and they'd read it to the kids. Teacher reading by proxy. Let's be honest about it. If you're not actually trying to read the text, you're not going to do the learning. You're not going to get that opportunity. Another very popular approach, especially as you move up through the grades, is 
the teachers essentially have stopped using the textbooks and they just tell kids what the texts say. Hear that all the time from science teachers. I can explain these concepts better than the textbook. So we have a textbook and the children are, the students are allowed to read it, but I know what's going to be on the tests, I know what's in the standards, and I can do PowerPoint every bit as well as Tim Shanahan can. <laughs> and so I will take them through what they need to know, and the books are there as an option. <laughs> you ask a 14-year-old if they want to read that stuff, it's probably not going to happen as an option. And of course there's the old-fashioned way which is you just ignore the fact that some of the kids can't read the book. You assign it and you call on Statue of Liberty Girl. You know the one whose arm's always up in the harbor? <laughs> I hope it's obvious to everybody in this room that if when, if when kids are asked to read a difficult text, the teacher says, no, 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 that's okay. I'm going to put you in an easier text or I'm going to read this to you so you don't have to or I'll tell you what it says so that it won't matter if you read it or not, or I'll ignore the problem of the fact that you can't read it, and I'll just move on. Those aren't going to work. Those aren't going to raise reading achievement. So your standards are lovely, but our practices aren't in line with them in any reasonable way. Now, I said I wanted to talk a bit about this idea of teaching kids with easier text. This is something I was taught in school when I was becoming a teacher, that you, it wasn't just a, an option. It wasn't just a way of getting around hard text. We were told that you had to teach students at their level or they weren't going to learn. Any of you told that? You ever hear of the instructional level? Yeah, that's what we're talking about here. The basic idea has been that students learn to read best from texts that are relatively easy. And I'm not saying with no challenge, but with a very, very small amount of challenge, where the, the youngsters are going to be able to actually read, a, a, read the text pretty well on their own. Various experts have claimed that if the books are too hard, students won't be able to learn for them, from them. So the, the trick has been you've got to figure out how to test these kids and identify what levels they are and match them up with books. And we've got to have book rooms so that we can do that. And we've got to have little dots on all the books so we can make sure everybody's reading at their level. Heck, there are schools that have their whole library collection dotted uh, so they can make sure that nobody reads a book that's too hard for them. Wouldn't that be painful? We did a survey a few years ago. Uh, it says 2013, but we collected the data in 2010. That was the year the Common Core Standards came out. And then we collected these data from ELA teachers who taught reading between the grades um, fourth grade and uh, 11th grade, I believe. Uh, we asked them a whole bunch of questions, but one of the questions that we asked them had to do with how they place students in text. And we gave them, you know, it was one of those you know, survey kinds of things, multiple choice, places to write in and, and so on. But we asked them a question. How do you usually, you know, match kids to book, it, books? Do you do it by uh, grade level? Do you do it by reading level? Do you do it by some combination of those things? Do you do it by interest? Do you do it by some other scheme? You know, please write it in. 64% of the, those fourth and fifth grade teachers in other words, two-thirds of them said they always did it by reading level. They made sure that kids were going to be in those relatively easy texts. That, what that usually means is they're going to teach kids with below grade level material. So, you, you know, you can raise the levels of the text all you want to. I'm going to go back and find the easier books and teach them with those. More than a third of the middle school teachers said they did that as well. And, and in fact, even a quarter of the high school teachers said that they, they did that, that they, they chose primarily on the basis of, of, of text level. So this is not a practice that a few schools use. This is a very, very you know, widely uh, used practice. Do you know where it came from? And it wasn't Faunus and Pinnell. I know there are people, oh yeah, it's Faunus and Pinnell, especially younger teachers. They're sure that's where it came from. This actually comes from a, a, a reading guru in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, a fellow by the name of Emmett Betts. 
Bentz wrote a very influential textbook uh, that published in 1946. And in that textbook, he put forth the idea that everybody had three reading levels. Everybody had an independent reading level, that is books that they could read very well on their own. They had an instructional level, that is books that might have a little bit of challenge to them, but under the supervision of a good teacher, the kids could learn from those books. And frustration level texts that needed to be avoided at almost any cost because those were so hard that if you had a youngster working in those books, they frankly wouldn't be able to learn even under the tutelage of a good teacher. Betts was the one who suggested how we could identify these levels, that we would have the kids read grade level passages and answer questions about those and we'd see how fluent they were and see how their comprehension was. He was the one who came up with the criteria for looking at what in those days we were referring to as informal reading inventories, and in a lot of places those have kind of been replaced by something very similar, running records these days. He was the one who came up with the criteria that said if a student was asked to read a text that they could read with 95 to 98% accuracy, that is, if you ask the youngster to read 100 words, If they could read 95 to 98% of those words correctly, that would be instructional level. And the reading comprehension at instructional level should be like 75 to 89%. In in other words, this is a text the kid can almost read perfectly all by himself, and that's the ones we're going to use to teach with. And, And Betts went farther than that. Betts said that their studies had shown that if you taught kids at their instructional level, they did better. They they made bigger gains in reading. It's not a surprise that reading teachers, people like me, for instance, I used to test the heck out of my kids at the beginning of the year. Everybody took an informal reading inventory that I administered one-on-one to make sure I could identify everybody's instructional level and get them in the right book so that they could learn, because I certainly wanted my kids to learn. I actually believed that it was one of the reasons why people thought I was a good teacher, because I was doing so well because of teaching kids at their instructional level. Later on, when I became a, a college professor and was doing research and stuff, I was shocked when I went back and read the study that Betts had, had talked about in his textbook. The study had never been published. Uh, but I went and hunted down the doctoral dissertation that one of his students had done under his supervision. And I was stunned when I looked at it and found that they hadn't actually done the study that Betts talked about. They didn't... Uh, they did a study, but their study... Well, there were, there, were, there were other folks who figured this out later on as well. They went to them later and they said, where did these criteria come from? Because they didn't come out of the study. And they, you know, for deciding what levels of books to put the kids and so on. And they said, well, we, uh, th- th- we really don't remember where we got that 75 to 89% comprehension. We just made it up. And what the study did is they, they, somehow they decided that you had to have 75 to 89% comprehension if you were going to learn from the text. And this, what the study did is they took a small group of fourth graders, they had them read some texts aloud and answer some questions about the text. And what they were looking for was what's the largest number of mistakes, oral reading mistakes the kids can make when they're reading those texts and still get that 75 to 89% comprehension. That was what the study was. That's where the 95 to 98% came from. The typical kid, if he'd made more than five errors, wasn't able to hit that comprehension level, and therefore, that was the level you shouldn't be teaching because you were getting you know, into that frustration territory. I was stunned. I wrote an article about it, but I didn't know what to do. I kind of stuck it in a drawer. Uh, I was afraid of it because... What do we do if if that isn't right? How do we teach these kids to read? We had no methodology for it. You know, you'd be an idiot to come up with any methodology for teaching kids how to read complex text if you believe that teaching kids with complex text was harmful to kids. 
You know, who would want to come out and say, well, I like to hurt kids. I've got a bunch of ideas how you could do it. I mean, that's crazy. Fortunately, there have been a handful of studies on this topic that have been done since. Um, and let me, I'm going to do this super quickly. I'm going to talk about each of these, but brief, brief, brief. Uh, back in the 1960s, and actually Powell did a series of these studies in the 60s, 70s, and I think in, even into the 80s. Uh, he, what he did, he, he bought the notion of the, the, the instructional level. He thought Betts was absolutely right. There was an instructional level, and if you matched text with kids in the right way, you would get optimum learning. So you know, he buys the notion. He buys the whole theory. He just thinks the criteria are screwed up. He thinks the, the books that they're putting kids in are, are actually too easy. And the reason he thinks that is because he does a series of studies, much larger than the original study that Kilgallen and Betts did. And they did it not just with fourth graders, they did it first, second, third, fourth, all the way up to eighth grade. So they had all these different grade levels. And Betts did exactly the same study. We want to see that 75 to 89 percent comprehension. What's the best fluency? You know, what's the worst fluency you can accept and still see those kinds of, of, of uh, comprehension scores? He came to two conclusions. One conclusion was. Wow, there is no consistent pattern here. And in fact, he concluded there isn't one instructional level. There are a whole bunch of them. There are different instructional levels for different grade levels. The kids could tolerate more disfluency at some levels and still comprehend well, and therefore you should be teaching those kids in harder texts than we'd been teaching them. And the second conclusion was that, in fact, in some cases, those... Uh, instructional levels that, that uh, Powell was coming up with were actually considerably higher and harder than what Betts was having kids taught at. Uh, Powell's work is widely cited in the field of reading, but he's always been cited as a kook. Um, he, he went to his grave knowing that his field thought he was ridiculous. You know, typically it'll say something, you know, you'll read about things like the instructional level and they'll talk about how Betts and Kilgallen came up with these wonderful uh, criteria and then the, this guy Powell has his own criteria that are kind of a little off. What's interesting is, of course, Powell had a lot of data, a lot of grade levels, and these guys didn't, and yet... Hmm, we kind of buy the one that isn't very data-driven. Second study on the list, Dunkeld. Colin Dunkeld, actually one of Powell's graduate students, he did a study. Not an experiment. He didn't intervene and change people's practice and stuff like that. He literally just went and tested a bunch of kids, second graders, uh, to figure out what their, uh, how well they could read the books that they were going to be taught from. So essentially gave informal reading inventories based on the, the text that kids were going to be taught at the levels they were going to be taught. And then essentially watched those kids for a year and, and tested them at the end of the year to see how much reading growth kids did. And of, of course, that's going to be varied. Some kids are going to have a lot of reading growth. Some are going to have a small amount. But what he looked for is for the kids who were getting the biggest reading gains, what was the match of text to their level? You know, were they in easier text? Were they in harder text? And what he was finding, very much what Powell was, uh, was predicting from his data, he was finding that, frankly, kids were doing better and were learning more when they were being taught from books that, heck, they could only read 85% of the words. Stuff is never cited. No one ever pays attention to Dunkel. Similar study done by a fellow named Jorgensen uh, uh, found... But it's a similar kind of study that he did, again, a correlational study where he went in, tested kids to find out what their level was according to the BETS criteria, and then looked at how, what the teacher was doing. You know, so, gee, you read at a fifth grade level according to the test, but the teacher has you in a fourth grade book or a sixth grade book or a fifth grade, you know, and so we could see how good the match was. People cite this study to, to show that I'm wrong, that people have studied this, but they don't like to tell you the results. Because the results were that he found no correlation between how kids were matched to the text and how much learning they were doing. It was absolutely inconsequential. 2000, Alyssa Morgan and her colleagues do a study. 
The first, finally, someone is going to do an experimental study. Let's try this out. Let's, let's see if this idea that's been around for more than 50 years works. Man, I would love if the drug industry worked like this. I could be so rich. I've got a pill you guys could take, and it'll take care of anything you've got. You just have to give me a lot of money for it. And in 50 years, we're going to test it to see if it works. <laughs> you think they are doing that. Well, okay, <laughs> it could be. In uh, Morgan, again at second grade level, she tests a bunch of kids with the, the, the bets criteria. She gets, figures out what their levels are. And she randomly assigns these students to one of three treatment groups. Uh, your section's over against that wall. You guys are going to be uh, one of our groups. Uh, let's say I've tested you. I find you're reading at a second grade level. I'm going to teach you with a second grade book. In other words, I'm going to match you just the way that Bet says you're going to be taught at your instructional level. You guys here in the middle, you're just like them. Remember, random assignment. But what I'm going to do with you guys, you read at a second grade level, I'm going to put you in a fourth grade book. I'm going to put you two grade levels above your reading level. In other words, clearly frustration level material. <laughs> and you guys, you guys, and again, you're just like them. You read at a second grade level, I'm going to put you in a sixth grade book. I'm going to put you four grade levels above. <laughs> now, you know how this is supposed to work. The guys over against that wall are going to make the biggest gains because they're matched to the text. You guys might learn something, but you're not going to learn as much as them. And these guys are going to burn down the school. They're going to be so frustrated. What do we say? It, it'll be like reading hieroglyphics. They do this for a school year. They come back. They test the kids. You'll be pleased to know all the groups made some gains. And you kids who are so perfectly matched to your text the way that we always tell you to do, you made the lowest gains of anybody. You learn less than these two groups. This, this middle group, this group that was placed two grade levels above their reading level, outperformed those kids at the year. They got all the learning they did plus almost an entire additional school year, like 75% of a school year. And you guys that I said were going to be such a disaster, you didn't do as well as that middle group, but you were about halfway in between the two groups. You were certainly better than the group against the wall over there. They used to not cite this study. It's published in a very good place. It's a well-done study. And yet, no one was paying attention to it. And, and as I hammered at it, now we're starting to get to some response. Because you, you can't deny that the study is there. And so now the attack on it isn't just, let's ignore it so nobody will know. Now the, the, the complaint about it has to do with, well, of course Morgan found that you could teach kids successfully with higher text. But you wouldn't want to do that because our teachers don't have those kinds of skills. The average teacher wouldn't be able to scaffold at the level that the kids were scaffolded when they were working through those texts in the, the Morgan study. And since our teachers aren't up to the level of that quality, um, this would be a foolish thing to do. Anybody curious about the scaffolding that was provided in that study? Let's see if you think teachers can do it here, because I know my teachers in Chicago could do it, often did. They had the, the, essentially what they did is they paired the kids up in the classroom, the better readers with the poorer readers. Yeah, the scaffolding was done by the seven-year-olds. Untrained seven-year-olds at that. Now, they were the better readers, I admit. Isn't there a TV show like that? You know, can you scaffold as well as a seven-year-old? I, I think it's... Renata O'Connor. Uh, I've got two numbers up there, 2002, 2010. O'Connor is a, a, a scrupulous researcher. She's a, a special education uh, researcher. She did a study in 2002 where she took a group of, of students, second, third, and fourth grades, who were um, uh, learning disabled. And the kids are going to get tutoring. They're going to be tutored, you'll never guess, in what? Phonemic awareness, phonics vocabulary, fluency, reading comprehension. And, you know, all one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, what she did is she, she takes all these kids, she randomly assigns them to one of three treatment groups, same kind of design that I was just describing. 
One of the groups isn't going to get any tutoring. They're a true control group. They're just going to get their regular classroom instruction. The other two groups are going to get this this one-on-one tutoring in addition to to what they normally get. And the only difference between these two groups is one of them is going to be taught, the kids will be taught with text at the kids' grade level, and the other one they'll teach them at the kids' reading level. Hmm. They do this for a length of time. They come in and they test the kids. And they find just the opposite of what I just told you that that Morgan found. Uh, O'Connor found that the the boys and girls who were tutored uh, at their grade level didn't do as well as the kids who were being taught at their reading level. Now, just to give you a sense, I said these were third, fourth, and fifth graders. The highest readers, according to their, their, you know, their, their testing, the highest readers were reading at a beginning second grade level. So these were kids who you know, might have been non-readers. They might have been reading like first graders. They might have been reading like second graders. Uh, and, but you know, that was the, the span of kids. So everybody was at least a year behind, and it sounds like maybe more than that. Um, O'Connor... Uh, found that the kids who were being taught at their reading level uh, made bigger gains in word reading and bigger gains in word analysis and I think bigger gains in fluency. She didn't find comprehension gains, but in all those important foundational skills, there clearly was an advantage uh, to being taught at reading level. And that, that study is cited a lot. People pay a lot of attention to that. Now, there are two things I want to tell you about that study that you need to know. One of them was in the study itself, and that is, I I told you, O'Connor is a scrupulous researcher. She didn't just look at, let's compare these sets of data. She went and actually looked at the the data to see who was doing better. You know, one group did better than another. You know, some kids uh, contribute more to that than, than the others. One thing she discovered when she did that, and it's right in the study, was that the kids who got the advantage out of being at their reading level were the lowest readers. It wasn't true for the top part of the group. Now remember, their highest readers were reading beginning second grade level. Their lowest readers were someplace below that. And so I could just write this off and say, see, none of your standards are asking you to teach beginning readers with harder text, so this study is irrelevant. But let's not do that. Let's keep it in the mix. The second thing you need to know about this study was, well, she did publish a second study. She came back in 2010. And in 2010, she and her team say, hmm, you know, there was something about that first study that concerned us. We noticed when we were observing the instruction that kids were given, that there was a a potential confound. In other words, there was another possible explanation. Something had intervened in the study that might be explaining the differences they found, and they wanted to check it out. What they had seen was that they saw a pattern of responding to kids' reading errors that seemed to differ across the groups. Uh, You know, in your group, if if a youngster was making a mistake, maybe the teacher just told the kids the words, and in yours, you know, the teachers were having the kids figure the words out. So she decided, let's go back and see if we can replicate this study, but we're going to make one change. We're going to have everybody respond to the errors in in exactly the same way so that we take that away as an explanation. And she did that. And she found absolutely no difference. These learning disabled third, fourth, and fifth graders did absolutely as well, made just as many, just as much reading gain if they were working with their grade level text or if they were working with their reading level text. So that fifth grader who maybe uh, would have been taught in a second grade book or a first grade book all of a sudden was being taught in a fifth grade book and doing just as well. I reported this at a at an IDA, at an International Dyslexia Association conference. And at some point in the talk, a group of, of disabled youngsters started to cheer. Now you've noticed I haven't gotten any cheers this morning, but these kids cheered. And I looked over to where they were sitting, and their mothers were crying. There were tears running down their face. And I haven't, maybe in the back a little bit, but most of that gentleman over there, most of them haven't been crying here either. As soon as I got done with the talk, I made a beeline over to the, this group to find out what the heck was going on. And what they'd said to me, what one of the, these teenagers said to me is, what you're saying is we don't have to work in the stupid books anymore. Kind of interesting. Hmm. 
It's funny, the O'Connor study, the 2002 study is, is cited a lot. 2010 study, not so much. People don't like to talk about it. And these last two, um, Melanie K uh, Kuhn and her colleagues uh, did a series of studies, uh, second and third grade, where they essentially had their scheme for teaching reading where they had kids working at grade level books and they put it up against guided reading where the kids were placed at their levels and they found substantial advantages to teaching kids at their, at their uh, uh, grade levels as opposed to the reading levels. And the Brown study, which is just a replication of the Morgan study but with third graders, uh, this one didn't find an advantage to being in the, the harder text, but also didn't find any disadvantage. There was not, no benefit from it. What I'm telling you is, given the entire body of research on this topic, there isn't a single study that supports the idea of teaching kids at their reading level. It's not, I'm not leaving out the ones that found that. I've talked it through the entire set. We have a practice that we have claimed is scientific because somebody claimed they had a study on it, <laughs> which they hadn't really done. Uh, we've ignored all these at attempts to understand you know, how this works. And, and you know, in every single case, it's either made no difference, so the kids, there was no reason to hold them back from the, the things at the, the kid's interest level, the things at the kid's cognitive level, the things at their age level. You know, th no reason to put them in the stupid books. Uh, I think we've made a huge mistake. So that raises the question, should we just buy harder books and throw the kids in there and, and tell the teachers not to adjust instruction for the, the different kids? And I'd say no, because I think there's a reason why so many of us bought into what Betts and others were saying. We bought into it because we know what happens in classrooms where kids can't read the books. We know what that looks like. And it doesn't make any sense. And so uh, I, I think the suggestion is we're, it's not going to be enough to put kids in, in harder text. You're going to have to adjust instruction somehow. The traditional theory said that there were two things you had to worry about. How well does the kid read? How tough is the book? If you can bring those into the right balance, you're going to get learning. And we do get learning, just not as much as we might get some other way. When Powell was asked to explain how kids were supposed to learn from these harder text placements, he just re-articulated the problem that it wasn't just a two-variable problem, it's a three-variable problem. Yes, it matters how hard the text is, and yes, it matters how well little Johnny can read. But the third variable is a teacher. These kids aren't there to teach themselves to read. We're supposed to be doing that. We can scaffold, we can add explanation, we can guide kids to read text in ways that allow them to learn even from that harder text. Is there any evidence that that's possible? Is there any evidence that we can actually place kids in frustration level text and scaffold it somehow so that they, they read it more like instructional level text? In fact, there are quite a few studies. See all those? Those are studies that did exactly that. They intentionally place kids in texts that they're going to have trouble reading. They intervene somehow, and those texts get easier. The kids learn from them. They get better and read in them. And in fact, in some cases, the texts end up at the kid's instructional level. I've come to believe the instructional level probably needs to be the goal, not the starting point. That we want to get our kids to the point where they can read a text with 95% accuracy and where they can read it with that 75 to 90%. That's not the starting point. You don't look for books that kids can already read well and say, oh, I'll teach them that. You go the other way. Here's a book that the youngster's going to have trouble with. Let's see if I can teach him well enough that he can read it that well. Oh, wait, these studies too, by the way. I don't have a lot of time, but I, what I want to do with everything that's left is I want to talk to you about what some of that instruction would look like. One of the things that, I think, let's see if I can do two. I want to show you one scaffold that everybody uses badly. I mean, we all use it. And one that, frankly, we don't use much at all. And there are many more. There are lots of different scaffolds we could use. One really simple to understand one is what if we go through and figure out 
some of the vocabulary the youngster's likely to have difficulty with, and we help them with it somehow. We pre-teach it, or you know, we somehow support that so that those words don't become the barrier I was talking about. I don't think I have ever seen a textbook that doesn't recommend pre-teaching certain vocabulary. I don't think I have ever seen a teacher's lesson plan on any of these websites that doesn't uh, you know, pull out the vocabulary that they think that needs to be pre-taught. So this is something that's widely used. It makes great sense. If the author's going to use vocabulary up here, we could wait till little Jimmy's vocabulary gets equal with the author's, or we could actually teach him the specific vocabulary that's going to hold him back. Makes sense, right? And there's studies showing that it works. See this passage, fourth grade passage. Photosynthesis may sound like a big word, but it's actually pretty simple. You can divide it into two parts. Photo is the Greek word for light. Synthesis is the Greek word for putting together, which explains what photosynthesis is. It's using light to put things together. You may have noticed that all animals and humans eat food, but plants don't eat anything. Photosynthesis is how plants eat. Guess what words the publishing company wants you to pre-teach? Ah, you got it. I would argue that is the one word there you cannot, you should not pre-teach. That's a good comprehension question, what is photosynthesis? If the passage is going to explain a term, why are we pre-teaching the term? Are you the kind of people who like to sneak in a the punchline of somebody else's joke, you know? It's, you're not making the youngster read better. You're making it so the youngster doesn't need to read at all. If you think some of the words that are used to explain photosynthesis might not be known by your kids, feel free to pre-teach those. That could really help them make sense of this. Or better yet, you know, give them a glossary. Put it on the whiteboard. Give them a... A handout. Gee, there are 10 words here I thought you might have some difficulty with. So here, here are simple definitions of them. Or look at this one. Some scientists have argued that these gases have heated up our atmosphere. They say global warming will affect our climate so dramatically that glaciers will melt, sea levels will rise. In addition, it's not just our atmosphere that can be polluted. Oil from spills often seeps into the ocean. And I've highlighted three words that clearly are not defined there explicitly. But are there any that you think the kids could figure out from context? Are there any that you think they might get? Give me one. Which one do you think they'll get? You think they'll get seeps. And there are reasons why you think that, right? Because the oil is somehow leaking or dripping into the ocean, we know. So why are we pre-teaching seeps? Why aren't we making seeps a comprehension question? Why aren't we turning it around instead of trying to get ahead of the, the kids? I know that most of these programs will have a lesson. They'll have some skill sheets on, you know, oh, using context. But why, when it comes to vocabulary, if an author is either going to define a word or is going to use a word so clearly with supportive context that you should be able to figure it out, would you ever pre-teach any of those? Every one of those it should become a question. If you think the kids can get it, if you, gee, I don't think they're going to get effect, then pre-teach it. Feel free. I think they could, they're going to get seeps. You might be wrong about this. You could be wrong. We're going to find that out once they've read it, and we'll ask them what it means, or we'll say, what does the oil do? Or what's the relationship of the oil and the ocean? However you want to ask it. And if they can't answer it, we're not just going to say, no, you're wrong. We're going to go back to the text and show them how to figure it out. That's not something that should happen on an occasional skill sheet. That should happen every day when the kids are reading. I'm going to skip this because I want to show you. I said I was going to show you two. There's a whole bunch of ideas on vocabulary there. All right, sentence structure. Explain clearly using at least three different reasons or drawing three diagrams why McClellan lost the battle. Or explain clearly why McClellan lost the battle. Give at least three reasons or draw three diagrams. Which of those is easier to understand? The bottom one, the second one? Yeah, I think most people find that easier. Here's our problem, ladies and gentlemen. Both of those are in good English. There's no problem with the grammar of either of those. Why do we keep taking, if the kids are going to have trouble with the first one, why do we keep dropping them back? Let's put them in an easier text instead of teaching them how to read the first one. This is out of a fifth grade book, or a fifth grade book now, given the new standards. 
However, on August 24, 2006, the International Astronomical Union, IAU, a group of individual astronomers and astronomical societies from around the world made an announcement. My hunch is, it's a guess, it's a prediction. My guess is the typical 10-year-old asked to read that sentence is gonna get the heebie-jeebies. They're not gonna have a clue what it's telling them. The reason I'm betting that, one, it's 26 words long. As sentences get longer, they put memory load on. It has, I think, five commas in it, which suggests there's a lot of embedding and, and relations that you have to tease out. Uh, there are, there's a, an acronym, there are parentheses, there are numbers. Is there a verb? Anyone find one? Made, yeah, the 24th word in the sentence. It's almost German. Some German constructions, you put the verb at the end. That's problematic because what linguists tell us is when you interpret a sentence, what your head is doing, what you're, you're doing in your mind, you might not be aware of it, is you're looking for the verb. We interpret sentences from the verb out. You find the verb and then you start connecting ideas to it. If you have to wait all the way to the 24th word, that makes this text very different from oral language. And so there are going to be a lot of kids who they don't know they're looking for it. You know, however, on August 24th, 2006, the International asked, ah, to hell with it. I can't find a verb. <laughs> I would definitely ask the kids what I asked you. Can you find a verb in that sentence? But see, I'm not going to even know that this is an issue unless I look at the text and say what, which sentences could be a barrier to learning. Which ones might my kids have difficulty making sense of? And then making darn sure I have a question about that. Yeah, but this isn't the most important idea. Our discussion's gonna be about a lot. Yeah, but I would put in a question like, what did the IAU do? If the kids can answer it, I was wrong. It wasn't that hard a sentence. If they can't answer it, we've gotta go back to the text and start showing them how you'd make sense of this. One way to do that might be this kind of a, you know, it's kind of a sentence diagram, but it's, it's a very light one. Um, you see that the blue, that's the subject. Do you see why the verb gets hidden? In science writing, the subjects are getting longer and longer, and the verbs in English are going farther and farther into the sentence. This is something that's been going on for more than 100 years in our language. It's a ch big change in our language. It's being led by scientific writing, but it's not just there. Or another possibility might be intensive questioning. There's not one way to do this. You know, who was this sentence about? Who are they? What did they do? What did they make? When, when did they do that? That kind of thing. Guiding kids through it so that when they hit a sentence like that, they don't feel like they're overwhelmed. Ladies and gentlemen, we have spent the last 70 years trying to protect our boys and girls from having to learn how to read more complex text. The hope has been they'd teach themselves on their own when they selected books that perhaps would be harder than the ones we were gonna teach them at school. That has maybe worked reasonably well for the most advantaged kids in our society. It has not worked so wonderfully well for the boys and girls who don't have all those advantages. The standards point the way to exposing kids to, teaching kids with, and in fact, trying to teach them to read text at these harder levels. But just having some text that's at those levels and being willing to place kids in them is not going to get kids over those barriers, is not gonna show them how to make sense of those. Giving kids guidance in vocabulary, giving kids guidance in, in breaking down sentences, giving kids guidance in lots of areas I didn't talk about, like building up their prior knowledge on a particular topic, or showing them how to make certain cohesive connections, or how to use text structure, or how to pull out the tone from a text, or how to analyze certain kinds of content. And you know, we can kind of go on and on and on. There are lots of examples in this, uh, in this PowerPoint of other instructional supports. There's not a, a single set of supports. Kids have to learn to deal with all of these. If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to expose kids to these harder texts, to hold them accountable for reading them, and for guiding them to read the, reading them successfully so that those kids learn how to figure out text, 
you can make this a much more equal society, a much fairer society, and one where a much higher percentage of our boys and girls are able, through their reading ability, to take advantage of, of the wonderful economic and social and civic benefits that this society provides to some of us, but not to all. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.